Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show. And today we are doing another jewel. As promised, uh, I've decided to jewel two of my favorite um, pilot's watches. And for today's wristwatch check, I decided uh, to put on my Navi timer. Uh, with all the hype of the uh, Basel World releases, well, uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to wear my Navi timer, but also really to kind of illustrate the point of just the, 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 the variety and the interesting dichotomy between all the different types, uh, not to mention fliegers of World War II, etc., and different styles you can get within one genre of watch, which I find utterly fascinating. Anyway, enough rabbiting on, let's get on with the jewel. So if you're not familiar with how this works, there are 10 categories, I mark them out of 10. I move this along down until we get to a final score. Please, please do feel free to keep your own scores along. This is of course in my own opinion as a um, owner of both of these incredible watches. And then do share your scores, what you get at the end in the comments. I'd love to Especially if you you are um, uh, an owner, a proud owner of these uh, one of these two um, incredible watches. In the red corner, we have uh, my rather famous now Zin 104, made in Germany. A very classic, minimal, but but yet um, interesting automatic, of course. And then in the blue corner, a heavyweight, we have one of the, if not the most iconic, uh, pilots watches of all time. This is the Rolex, uh, I almost said Explorer, <laughs> GMT Master 2 16710. Yeah, different price categories, very much the, the king here of the mid-range versus um, a luxury heavyweight. So I think this, this will really illustrate the point, what the difference is between them, especially with the dramatic uh, price differential between them. What do you get? What do you not get? Um, talking of value, that's the first category. So let's have a look at the scores. And uh, yeah, a little bit surprising, but I had to give the uh, 10 out of 10 to the Zin. Um, the Zin is a smidgen over $1,200 new, and I think it is absolutely fantastic value. They also retain their value extremely well uh, for a non-luxury brand, although we are creeping into luxury quality, which we'll discuss later. Um, they do incredibly well, and I think, I think a lot of it is down to Zin's careful control over distribution. Uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to find these on the grey market. They really do an amazing job at uh, retaining their value and, and controlling the, the sale of these. Uh, Watch buys uh, the official, uh, I think the only authorised dealer, I might be wrong, in the United States, seem to always be perpetually sold out of these. So there's incredible demand and that really helps them retain value, which is unheard of. Well, not unheard of, but very rare in the mid-range. Now the Rolex, yes, okay, look, I'm going to be brutally honest here. The, the, the prices have skyrocketed on these, okay? They're very desired, they're very lusted after, but in my opinion, it's really not worth it. You're paying for a lot of hype. Um, okay, yeah, I'm a bit of a hypocrite because I own it and I absolutely love it. You know, I bought this for, I'm going to be vulgar now and talk a little bit about the cost. I bought this for around five. They're skyrocketing now, they're around, I don't know, eight, nine, possibly even ten. Uh, because this is obviously the pre-ceramic. This is from 2001 or 2002, I can't quite remember. The Zin is um, from the last couple of years. I'm not actually sure the, uh, the release date of that. So guys, if you know, do share it below in the comments. But yes, dated by today's standards. And, you know, you're still paying. I mean, the, you can buy an entire collection for the price of this watch. The only thing that I, I still give it a strong 7 for is because, obviously, it's going to increase in value. And I think that's that keeps the, 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 the score from plummeting, basically. Something else to consider about the value is the Zin is a lot more affordable to maintain and uh, fix when needed over the years. The Rolex, you're going to pay Rolex prices, basically. So let's move on to design and let's just clarify the difference between design and, and style. Style is more to do with aesthetic. Design is how well it's designed to do its job. And nines all round. I mean, okay, very different complications. 
this has the day date with a, a bi-directional countdown bezel, um, which I must say is, is very secure feeling. So both bezels are ratcheted. The GMT is 120 click while the Zin is 60. Extremely well executed watch. And then of course the, the Rolex, as we'll discuss in history, uh, it has a GMT also with a bi-directional um, bezel tw with 24 hours to keep track of that second time zone. Very useful complications, both designed obviously for pilots. Uh, this was intended for intercontinental uh, pilots, you know, when you're crossing um, time zones. And this is a complication uh, more for short flights, obviously. So let's talk about the Zin first. Well, first of all, I think it's design is almost a 10. There are a few little things um, that, 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 that stop it being from absolutely perfect. It's a watch very much in that Germanic style of precision, no nonsense. Uh, you know, you just look at the way the syringe style hands touch the, the markings and the monochromatic high contrast, uh, you know, black and white theme. Uh, these incredible angular lugs. Uh, we even get a display back and even a decorated movement, the amount of testing that has gone into it, the proportions in relation to everything else. I mean, actually, the, the, the scale of these watches is very, very similar. The Zin slightly larger at 41 millimeters in diameter with the Rolex at the, um, the standard um, 40. Height-wise, they're almost the same. The Zin just a half a millimeter thinner at 11.5 with the Rolex at 12. Lug to lug, interestingly, they're both 46 and they both share a 20 millimeter lug width, which is just a fantastic size, both extremely legible. And I love the design of the, the, the Rolex. Certainly gets a nine because it's it's um, often imitated by so many. It's, it's a leader. It's also worth noting that the Rolex definitely has evolved from its strictly instrument roots. Uh, there is more refinement going on, such as, you know, applied markers, uh, etc. There are some things that, again, about the Rolex, and I've discussed in the five likes and um, dislikes of this watch, but both of them, in terms of what they're designed to do, they do it impeccably well. Built for task. They're both uh, stainless steel. They both have sapphire glass. The GMT also has uh, drilled lug holes, which makes it extremely easy to change out the uh, the strap or bracelet. Uh, that is one thing I do wish the uh, the Zin had. Although if we look at these little grooves here, uh, it's very much designed for, you know, popping a, a Zulu or a NATO strap in there easily. These are little things that, that the, the devil that is in the detail that just make this watch um, just, oh God, in a class of its own, it really is. Interestingly, without a bracelet, they're roughly the same weight. Uh, it's about 73 grams. So let's move on to the movement, and this is where it gets really interesting. Well, there's no doubt here that the Rolex wins with 10 out of 10. It's a Kosk certified caliber 3185, which is, of course, automatic. We get the Breguet hairspring in there, bidirectional winding, uh, 31 joules, 28,800 vibrations an hour with a 50 hour power reserve. It performs impeccably well and it's, it's a remarkably robust movement. It was launched in 1988 and was then uh, replaced in 2005. Hacking, manual wind, as you'd come to expect, and it is even decorated. The Zin still scores an impressive eight. And in fact, we can even see the movement and have the pleasure of enjoying it in the back, if I just, uh, sorry, wipe all the smudges away, you could see it beating away there. We get even decoration at this level, which is quite surprising, a custom gold tone rotor, blued screws. We also get Cote de Genève stripes. So this is the Silita SW220-1. Uh, unfortunately, we get a, a lesser power reserve, the 38 hour power reserve, 26 joules, also operates at 28,800 vibrations an hour. We have hacking manual wind, and itself is a clone of, well, actually, it's, it's, a, it's a slightly improved, nuanced, clone of the ETA, the top grade version, and uh, it is regulated out of the factory. Despite not being COSC certified, I am getting COSC certified um, level of performance, which we'll discuss a little bit later on. Okay, so let's move on to 
brand history and prestige. So this is really interesting and it's no surprise that the Rolex gets a 10 here. Let's discuss Zinn first. Still very, very respectable. And uh, Zinn started quite late in the game in 1961 by Helmut Zinn, who passed away quite recently, very sadly. Uh, God bless his soul. And he was a pilot um, in World War II, in fact. And then he carried on being a professional pilot. He founded Zinn originally to make cockpit uh, equipment and then eventually diversified into uh, watches. It was just a natural progression. And you really feel that, that uh, aviation heritage and DNA uh, as well. Although Zinn has now exploded into other areas such as their amazing divers and even a few dress watches, at heart they've always been tool watches and their prices reflect that. But despite being just over half a century in business, they have achieved a hell of a lot, uh, supplying watches to um, elite special forces of the German Federal Police uh, with some of their divers. Uh, and even being worn by astronauts like Reinhard Führer during the Space Lab D1 mission. I, I believe that was in 1985. And these are just some of their achievements. But above that, they have a quite a strong cult following among watch enthusiasts. They're not necessarily known to the mainstream. Very much it is a kind of aficionado's brand of impeccable quality and still made in Frankfurt in Germany to this day. One definite bonus of the Zinn is that you never have to contend with the discourteous question, is that a Rolex? Zinn very much flies, um, forgive the pun, under the radar. And I really enjoy that about the brand. The chances are that if anybody does guess it's a Zinn, they're most definitely into watches. Well, the Rolex GMT is completely on the opposite side of the scale. It's a ginormous, uh, huge, instantly recognizable uh, luxury watch brand, probably the m most well-known and associated with aspirational kind of luxury. Few brands have achieved as many firsts in terms of horological history, uh, and few are as much loved, revered, hated, and uh, copied uh, as Rolex. Founded in 1905 by Hans Wilsdorf, of course, the Rolex GMT is, is one of their uh, most iconic watches. Developed in 1954 in cooperation with Pan American uh, World Airways, it was, it was designed to meet the evolving needs of airline pilots of that day, especially as intercontinental travel was growing rapidly. Uh, so pilots therefore needed something to, to um, keep track of multiple time zones more frequently. And thus the GMT Master was born. It was the first wristwatch to feature a fourth hand and hour markers on the outer bezel to indicate um, time in multiple time zones simultaneously. The GMT obviously comes from um, Greenwich Mean Time. The GMT's illustrious history began with the reference 6542, uh, originally with a two-tone bezel to distinguish daytime from nighttime hours. Uh, this was produced all the way up until 1959, and this led to several partnerships with R Rolex and the airline industry, as well as NASA and the United States Air Force. The GMT Master became the official watch of Pan Am. Over the years, the GMT Master line became known for a variety of color coordinations um, and their quirky nicknames, uh, such as the one we're looking at today, which is, of course, nicknamed the Pepsi in honor of that blue and red color scheme. Then there was the red and black, uh, which was the 16760, the Coke, and then there was the copper-toned uh, root beer. Uh, recently, we've seen the addition of the modern ceramic blue and black, nicknamed the Batman. In the 80s, the GMT Master II was born, and specifically, this is where we're catching up with my reference, so the, the first GMT Master II was the 16760, and then uh, my reference, which was introduced in 1999. Um, Rolex have continued to produce uh, the GMT. In 2007, they introduced the reference 116710, which I also owned very temporarily. I, I didn't take to it. And that was, of course, the uh, ceramic version with the triple lock crown, the green 24-hour hand, the maxi dial, ceramic bezel, new bracelet, new movement, that Rolex rehort uh, in a bezel ring, and all the rest of it. And, of course, the 2018 release, which they brought back the Pepsi with an updated uh, Jubilee bracelet.
So the Rolex is unequivocally the icon. So it's no surprise that the Rolex here scores a 10. But I, th I still think the Zin scores a, a strong 8 um, because it also is a very highly respected brand. And in a, in a certain way, free of that, um, the luxury stigma um, and a little less... Well, I don't think the Rolex is pretentious, but um, the Zin is definitely... You could say the Zin is, is what Rolex used to be, you know, unabashed um, tool watches before they became or had to diversify into becoming luxury uh, goods. Anyway, let's move on to quality. Now, this is going to surprise a lot of people. I only gave the Rolex here eight. This, um, this undeniably is, uh, sorry, I just knocked my pen over. This undeniably is very dated by today's standard, the aluminium insert, for example. I actually replaced the, um, the original uh, bracelet and a lot of people scoffed at me for doing so, but you know, at the end of the day, it's my choice. Ironically, I traded it for an even worse bracelet, which is, you know, folded uh, links and, and hollow end links. Actually, the original was the uh, 78790 Oyster bracelet, completely brushed with the flip lock. And it was terrible. It had hollow end links and uh, even the center links of that bracelet were hollow as well. Quite shoddy quality because Let's not forget, this is a watch from uh, the early 2000s. Rolex were already a luxury commodity at that time. So, yeah, a little, yeah, they, there was some corners cut. Nowadays, the, the quality of Rolex is extremely high, extremely impressive. But I've got to be honest, compared to some other timepieces, um, this does feel a little dated. Even the clasp on this particular Jubilee is worse, uh, but I just got a thing for Jubilees. Uh, you, you've got to ignore me, guys. Um, I'm an 80s baby, and I just have some kind of, I don't know, sentimental attachment, I guess. Uh, and strangely, they do remind me of some of my earlier SKXs. Uh, but anyway, the quality, I think, on the Zin is exquisite. I mean, for $1,200, you're getting the decorated movement. I've I've remarked at the polishing and the level of just, just the edges and everything lining up being so sharp. Uh, don't get me wrong, it does that on the Rolex. But I've never seen or heard of Zin uh, having shoddy quality. Everything is just perfection. Really, really beautifully done. I don't feel any corners have been cut, uh, especially at this price range. I almost find this quite difficult to say, but the finishing on the case of the Zin, in my opinion, is better <laughs> than the Rolex. Now, if I was to get my Submariner and compare a contemporary Rolex, then I would say the Rolex is better. The Zin also has anti-reflective coating on both the inside and the outside. Even the bi-directional bezel uh, has better action than the Rolex. You just feel the quality. These are incredibly well made. And again, you know, I know I'm repeating, but for the money, it's extremely impressive. Let's move on to style. Well, here we get a stronger mark for the Rolex. Um, stylistically, it's uh, the most imitated. I think there is something quite alluring about that uh, flash of blue and red. Instantly recognizable, although you could argue that's probably a, a bad thing and I guess that's what stops it from getting a 10. It has a little bit of pizzazz and of course the GMT you know you can get it in precious metals. Um, so arguably okay it's not supposed to be a dress watch but you can wear it as such. There is something slightly elegant about it and of course I think because of its history, it just evokes that charm and romance of the aviation age. The Zin is, is perhaps um, a bit of a slow release uh, mechanism uh, in terms of its, its charm. It does have some beautiful, dazzling features like the hand and that lovely domed sapphire there. But it's quite understated. It doesn't flash at you, there's, 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 you know, despite the high polish uh, case. But it is handsome all the same, and wearing it... I do feel it um, makes me feel like a, it, it reminds me actually of like vintage subs, you know. It's more of an acquired taste, that slight vintagey feel, and that is not a word. <laughs> One thing they unquestionably share is their classic aesthetic. Something I enjoy about both watches is that they will look just as good in the future as they do now. Even better worn as they pick up character. And I should point out that the Pepsi has that Cyclops as well, which sometimes 
you know, turns a lot of people off. Okay, let's move down to versatility. Well, I think the Zin gets top marks here. With its monochromatic color scheme, it's certainly an absolute strap monster. This thing can go with rubber straps, NATOs, all kinds, you can dress it up with crocodile straps. It's relatively thin, it's thinner actually than the GMT, so you can, it does slide under the cuff. Okay, it's not a dress watch, but it can handle any situation. Also, the day-date complication is extremely useful and functional for an everyday watch. And despite being a countdown and not a dive time bezel, once you get used to this, it's actually quite useful. And I have to admit, I don't use the GMT function as much as I find the day-date complication as useful. So versatility-wise, I think the, the, the Zin is, is absolutely top marks. Because of its very classic, tasteful aesthetic, it's so compatible. Uh, also the black and white it just works with literally any strap. Right now I've got it on a, uh, what is this, Colorab? Yeah, the one piece. Um, I forget what are these these are called, but um, yeah, it just just goes with anything, you know. The GMT complication, yeah, it's it's useful if you if when I'm checking uh, the time, if it's appropriate to call family back home, the other side of the pond, uh, uh, the the other side of the Atlantic. It's not as immediately um, useful. Also, versatility wise, it doesn't work on all straps. I think the blue and red, yeah, it's not as compatible with as many straps, um, although. Arguably, it's quite slender. You can use it in various situations. Strong eight, I think it's strong eight. Okay, moving down to performance. Well, there's no doubt here that um, the Rolex wins with COSC certified uh, accuracy, a much better, brighter loom. We have Super Luminova and, and with those markers, um, although these days with the new maxi dial, uh, it seems quite dated, in my opinion, more legible um, and quicker to, to get your orientation than the Zin. Uh, we also have a vastly superior power reserve of 50 hours compared to the power reserve of 38 with the Zin. So the performance is 10 out of 10. The Zin, still does extremely well as i've said out of the uh from straight from the uh the factory you're getting almost or within cost uh, performance although not certified the only downfall i think is is that slightly weak power reserve with the Solita. Uh, but if we go to durability you'll see where the zin slips ahead there we get 200 meters water resistance with the screw down crown. It's uh, shock resistant. The, they have actually drop tested this to uh, DIN ISO 1413 uh, standard. And it has an anti-magnetic resistance of 4,800 amperes. The Rolex still scores highly with durability, mainly because of that 60 plus years of proven dependability. Nobody can deny, while the Rolex movements aren't exactly the prettiest of things, they are absolute rock solid, built like tanks. And let's not forget, they are entirely in-house made. You also get the legendary Oyster case. We get 100 meters water resistance with the twin lock screw down crown. So while only only half the, uh, the Zin's depth rating, um, it's still more than capable. You don't have to worry about jumping into a pool or, or this in the rain or anything like that, which, you know, just to give you a context, my Navi timer there is 30 meters and, you know, I, I don't even feel comfortable wearing that in the rain. So, okay, let's move on down to X Factor. Well, this is probably uh, the Zin's weakest area. In comparison to the uh, Rolex GMT, the Rolex GMT, it's been in countless movies. It's a movie star. It's um, been in James Bond. Um, I think Pussy Galore wore it in Goldfinger. Dustin Hoffman wore it in three movies, uh, Marathon Man, uh, Straw Dogs, and I believe the it was Kramer versus Kramer, but um, I have to double check that last one. But yeah, countless movies, highly sought after by collectors. Uh, as the price reflects. I looked and looked at countless GMTs and, and I finally, you know, I came to the realization that this is this is the right one. And I've owned plenty, you know, um, and I'm done with my search for the GMT. This is, in my opinion, one of the best. Yeah, there's things I don't like about it, but unequivocally, the X Factor, it has it in bucket loads. That inexplicable special quality, the magic you feel when you wear it, it just has it. It just 
has it. You know, the romance of the Pan Am age, and it's just cool. You know, it is absolutely cool. The Zin very much is um, a more subtle piece. Uh, it takes you a while to, to really appreciate just what it is. Um, it doesn't have any movie stardom to it. it it's not worn by anybody of <laughs> that's anybody famous. Very much an enthusiast piece. And what some people could argue that's that's great, you know, that's that's a fantastic thing. But it doesn't have that thing that just pops. It is undoubtedly a classy. I mean, I love this watch. I think it's pure class. It's unpretentious. But I've got to be honest. It it doesn't have that X factor. You know, there, there's a reason why I sold and then rebought it. And you know, um, I doubt very much I'd I'd sell my GMT unless I got another GMT, you know? Dramatic difference here. Also, you're not getting any of Zinn's uh, special proprietary uh, technologies that um, they're so respected for. This very much is, at the end of the day, an entry level. And don't get me wrong, it's a fantastic entry level Zinn, but it doesn't have anything that really pushes it to that next level. You could accuse it of perhaps being a little bit boring, a little bit of a safe bet. Um, I love it, don't get me wrong, I absolutely adore it. So anyway, I guess we should uh, look at the final scores and you guys might be a bit surprised at this, but yeah. Wow, only only one point between them. That is That is interesting, that is really interesting. Considering uh, what, this is, um, you know, eight times the price. Are you getting eight times the watch? Personally, I don't think so. Um, I love both very, very much. Of course, I, I, I love the GMT that little bit more. Anyway, guys, let me know what scores you gave the watches, uh, which, in your opinion, do you prefer? Please do comment in the comments below. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.